appear around the globe. Unidentified objects streaking across the sky. Wow! Look at that! Home video cameras capture it all. But why do these supposed UFOs keep appearing in the same places? Mexico, Brazil, even United States nuclear bases. Is it a coincidence? Or are these places, these events, proof of UFO hotspots? Sao Paulo, Brazil, 1988. Gulf Breeze, Florida, 1988. Las Vegas, Nevada, 1990. Mexico City, Mexico, 1991. Wow! Whatever it is, it's, uh, it's something strange. What do all these cities have in common? There are so many UFO sightings reported in these places that they are all considered to be UFO hotspots. A UFO hotspot would be an area that represents a high number of sightings of abnormal or unusual aircraft that are unidentifiable. It's been long recognized that UFO sightings tend to come in waves. In other words, there's an area of the country or the world where the number of UFO sightings increases for some unknown reason. There are theories about why these areas seem to attract UFO attention. To some, the reason is the natural forces of the Earth, like volcanoes and earthquakes. The UFOs appear to be observing us. Well, the UFOs have come to certain spots because of what's going on at the time. Uh, one of the things that seems to stimulate UFO activity is a major disruption in the Earth. Still others believe that human behavior is at the root of these sightings. One of the things that, that has to do with hot spots is that once somebody notices something, uh, then others are going to look also. That uh, you may not pay much attention to your surroundings. Someone says, gee, last night there were three mysterious lights went by. The next night you're going to be watching, and there's a much better chance that you're going to see them than if you're just sort of walking along, looking at your feet. According to the National UFO Recording Center, there have been more than 13,000 UFO sightings in the United States since 1990. Making such places as the mysterious Area 51 in Nevada, Washington State, and Florida, UFO hotspots. Still, with reports of UFOs coming in from as far-flung locales as Quito, Ecuador, Haifa, Israel, Stuttgart, Germany, and Sydney, Australia. America doesn't seem to be the only place getting these unexplained visits. Many people don't realize that UFOs are not seen only in the United States. They're seen all over the world. There are hot spots all over the world. Brazil is one of those hot spots. With 549 sightings, Brazil was second only to the United States in reported UFO activity in 2001. And unlike America, where UFO reports are traditionally met with skepticism, Brazil has a strong tradition of accepting UFO sightings and even publicly conducting government investigations. Generally, South American countries are more open to this type of thing. There are other cultures that are more tolerant of people's perceptions, their emotions. Uh, they're more open to events that may be part real, part mystical, and they do not have the same strong norms, you might say, against uh, reporting unusual or paranormal kinds of experiences. We also have to think in terms of the kinds of religions uh, that predominate, uh, in that uh, if you have religions that make opportunity for uh, saints and angels and things like that, uh, the idea of uh, powerful visitors from afar is, I think, much more uh, easy to accept. October 15, 1957. Brazil is the location for one of the world's first accounts of an alleged alien abduction. Antonio Villas Boas was a young man. He was driving a tractor in a field. Uh, he claimed he saw an object come down out of the sky and land nearby. 
He was greeted by aliens taken on board, washed off with some kind of a substance that uh, smelled very badly to him. He made, made him vomit. And he later thought maybe that might have been something like a disinfectant or the like. While he was in this enclosure, a female alien type came in and had sex with him. And then went away and he was dumped back out. To many, this seems like an outlandish story. But V.S. Boas' reluctance to profit from the incident lends the tale an air of credibility in many quarters. And several months after the incident, the story gets some scientific backing when he is diagnosed with radiation poisoning. He is examined by Dr. Olavo T. Fontes, a professor of medicine at the National School of Medicine of Brazil. One of the very important people in Brazil was a Dr. Olavo Fontes. He was a medical doctor. He worked for the Brazilian government. He investigated the case, and he said that, as far as he was concerned, it was a good case. It really happened the way that the young man said. Less than six months after the alleged Vilas Boas abduction, the Brazilian Navy has a well-documented encounter with a UFO. In February of 1958, aboard the Almirante Saldana, a civilian photographer named Almiro Baruna takes five photographs of what seems to be a ringed, oval-shaped object. The photographs are shown to Ussolino Kubitschek, the president of Brazil. Not wanting to keep this information secret, Kubitschek releases the pictures to the public, and they soon appear on the front pages of the nation's newspapers. That particular UFO was never seen again, but UFO incidents, like that on board the Almirante Saldana, continue to be reported to this day in Brazil. In the mid-1990s, Brazil's UFOs again make worldwide headlines. On January 20th, 1996, it is alleged that extraterrestrials were recovered in Virginia, Brazil. The emergency personnel were called in. They were able to recover one of them for certain, as, as rumor has it, and allegedly took it to a local hospital. According to unconfirmed reports, government doctors perform an autopsy on the alien. And of course, from this point, the uh, trail goes cold, and no one is quite sure as to where that particular ET or alleged ET had disappeared to. Despite several purported eyewitness accounts, the Brazilian government, which has been so forthcoming in the past, denies the Varginha encounter and that an alien was ever captured. Everything that was in any way connected with this sighting somehow vanished. Ironically enough, after this creature was allegedly recovered, there was a high number of UFO sightings in the area. While most experts doubt the veracity of the Varginha ET incident, the long persistent history of UFO sightings in Brazil is harder to ignore. One curious theory proposes that the ongoing destruction of the Amazon rainforest may be attracting extraterrestrial attention. If you were to look at Brazil from space, you would see that a vast area of that remote land is on fire. They're burning off the rainforest. That's changing the whole ecology of the planet. If you were observing a planet and what's going on there, you would definitely want to look at Brazil. And that seems to be the case. Coming up. In Mexico, mysterious images caught on tape during a solar eclipse seem to suggest that the world's sacred sites may be UFO hotspots. Mexico is a land with a sacred past. A land dotted with pyramids built by the ancient Mayans and Aztecs. Monuments to the gods still standing hundreds of years after their makers are gone. 
Could the sacred energy that permeates these buildings be attracting otherworldly visitors and making Mexico a UFO hotspot? There are areas around the Earth known as sacred spots. And these areas have been known for a large number of sightings of abnormal or unusual aircraft that are unidentifiable. July 11th, 1991. In an event predicted hundreds of years earlier by the Mayans. The longest solar eclipse of the 20th century shrouds Mexico City in midday darkness. Millions of people look towards the heavens. Many armed with their video cameras. But their cameras capture more than they expect. People all over the city, Mexico City, were taking videos. And they were getting things that weren't the eclipse. They were getting strange things flying around in the sky. Nearly 20 different people scattered across the city videotape what appears to be a saucer-shaped object floating above the horizon. Theories surface as to what the strange object may be. Once the moon passes directly in front of the sun, of course, it gets quite dark, and you start to see the stars, you can see the bright planets, you can see Venus or any other bright star or planet that happens to be above the horizon at that time. Undoubtedly, that's what a lot of people were seeing. But when all of the different videos shot from multiple locations around the city are analyzed, the images seem to show Venus and the mysterious object as clearly separate entities. Some experts offer another theory. Perhaps the phenomenon is the result of the video cameras themselves, as Mexico's emergence as a UFO hotspot coincides with the proliferation of affordable home video recorders. A uh, camcorder is made with an automatic focus and an automatic uh, aperture control to try to control the amount of light. And so it is not made to focus against the dark background. An automatic camera cannot focus on these objects without seeming to impart motion and changes in shape to it. But many disagree that the sightings were just a trick of the camera and point to subsequent events as proof. Over the course of the next six years, more than 1,500 videos and photographs of UFOs surface throughout Mexico. Many of the alleged UFO sightings appear near ancient Mayan and Aztec pyramids. One area with a lot of sightings is Tepatzlan, a resort village some 60 miles south of Mexico City. According to UFO researcher Carlos Diaz, 60% of its residents report having seen a UFO. And local air traffic controllers confirm that radar regularly detects unidentified objects over the area. Tepatzlan is chiefly known for its ruins of a 14th century Aztec pyramid. To some ufologists, ancient sacred spots like this one represent power points that may be attracting UFO activity. There are many power spots around the world where there are certain geological activities and fluctuations in the fields, you might call them vortexes or uh, portals, where there is a lot of UFO activity. Some believe that extraterrestrials have used these portals to enter our world and also that they may have actually been responsible for the construction of some of the world's ancient sacred sites, including the Great Pyramid in Giza, Egypt. There's less than two hundredths of an inch tolerance between the, the stones. The tolerances to which it's built exceed the tolerances that we use in our space capsule. The more you study the Great Pyramid, the more you begin to realize there was something going on there that goes beyond our understanding. More than 4,000 years old, the pyramid is built from over 2 million stones. Each side is perfectly oriented to the cardinal points of the compass. North, south, east, and west. The maximum error between the side lengths is astonishingly less than 0.1%.
people have looked at these structures and said, well, you know, they must have built these with some idea of making contact with aliens, or the aliens have somehow helped them build these structures. Another theory is that both the ancient architects who built the sites and the alleged UFOs who visit them are attuned to a supposed geomagnetic energy force called ley lines. A grid-like pattern that covers the entire Earth. Ley lines are geometric, they're like fields or lines of energy. And there's all kinds of intersections of certain ley lines which seem to create magnetic anomalies. Ley lines have also been linked to tectonic activity, the movement of the Earth's plates, a force that results in earthquakes and volcanoes, and provides another potential explanation of UFO activity in Mexico. One of the reasons I believe that Mexico City is indeed a, a uh, hot spot for unidentified flying objects is due to the volcano that's, that's near Mexico City where large numbers of legitimate unidentifieds have been filmed. UFOs have frequently been reported near Popocatapetl, Mexico's Smoking Mountain. They've been keeping a camera on that mountain ever since it started erupting and they've been finding in those pictures very clear disc-shaped objects. Now some people have tried to explain them as rocks that are blasted out of the volcano and they take an aerodynamic flight path and look like there's something flying when they're not. That's pretty hard to believe when you see the direction they actually go. They come down and toward the mountain rather than going up from the mountain. Why would UFOs hover over volcanoes? One theory proposes that high levels of hydronium ion, also called H3O, are typically found in places with increased geological activity, like volcanoes. H3O has an extra hydrogen atom in it, and that extra hydrogen atom can be split off and used as hydrogen fuel or for energy. And it's in the splitting of this uh, extra particle that you can create a fusion effect. It's possible that these UFOs may be harnessing this type of energy for their systems to perhaps propel themselves through the atmosphere. So perhaps UFOs are interested in Mexico more as an intergalactic gas station than for its sacred ancient structures. Coming up next, 10 of America's nuclear missiles suddenly shut down as a glowing disc hovers above Malmstrom Air Force Base. As the control center for some 221 Minuteman intercontinental ballistic missiles, Malmstrom Air Force Base near Great Falls, Montana, is an essential part of the nuclear arsenal for the United States. For decades, Malmstrom and other strategic air command centers like it have been the primary potential targets for the country's enemies. But many UFO experts wonder if these bases have also been attracting a different kind of attention. Are America's nuclear installations UFO hotspots? One interpretation of UFO activity is that these entities, assuming that they are entities, are interested in our technological development. We're a very violent uh, species, as, as you know if you watch television at night. So that, that alone is a reason that they would have to pay attention to what we're doing. March 16, 1967. Reports of UFOs at Malmstrom seem to demonstrate an extraterrestrial interest in America's nuclear forces. The way it happened, according to Robert Salas, who was stationed underground in one of the missile complexes, was that he received a phone call from a security guard on, up on top, up on ground level, saying, in effect, that there was a large, red, glowing, disc-shaped object hovering in front of the facility. And the guards were extremely frightened about this, as you can imagine. He kind of laughed and sort of said, you know, back off. The security guard called a second time 
saying uh, even more panicky that the UFO was now hovering right outside the gate and was very close. They were observing the, the status board in the launch complex and they noticed that the missiles started going offline. Clunk, 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 clunk. Ten of the missiles, one at a time, just boom, 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 shut down. The missiles quit functioning. So we were really out of business as a nuclear deterrent at that time. The incident at Malmstrom is neither the first nor the last time that the security of the United States nuclear sites is supposedly compromised by a UFO incursion. This supposed trend in UFO activity is noticed as early as 1952 by Captain Edward Ruppelt, the first chief of Project Blue Book, the Air Force's official investigation of UFO reports. Ruppelt discovers what he calls an ominous correlation between UFO sightings and the locations of the nation's nuclear facilities. If you're in the military and someone is displaying an interest in your strategic capabilities, it's an alarming situation. It raises national security questions. A lot of investigation went on to determine what could happen. The Boeing company that was responsible for some of the equipment was involved. The U.S. government was involved in investigations. The actual reason for so many uh, missiles going down simultaneously was a big puzzle. They found absolutely um, that an, an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse, may have fried the electronic workings in the missiles. However, there was no attempt whatsoever to relate the EMP, the pulse, to the presence of a UFO outside. In fact, the, the presence of the UFO out on the perimeter was dismissed as hearsay. We have no hard evidence that there really were any UFOs there. Nobody got any clear photographs or videos or anything like that. We just have somebody's perception that they went out and they saw a light in the sky. But the source of the EMP, a radiation wave that disturbs the function of electronic equipment, remains undetermined. And the government has never explained why so many missiles malfunctioned at the same time. It's important to bear in mind that these missiles are designed to be independent systems. So if you do something to affect one missile, it won't affect all the other missiles because they're totally separate. So whatever caused this event was able to shut down a whole variety of missiles that were spread around a large geographical area around the launch control complex. Fewer than 10 years later, five strategic air command bases, including Malmstrom, are placed on high priority alert as a result of repeated reports of UFOs over nuclear weapons storage systems. In 1975, right along the northern tier frontier, in many of the different Air Force bases, Falcon Bridge in Ontario, Canada, Loring Air Force Base in Maine, Wordsmith Air Force Base in Michigan, Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota, and Malmstrom Air Force Base in uh, Montana, all experienced a series of unidentified objects. Some of these were explained away as helicopters, some of them were explained away as unidentified aircraft, some of them were called UFOs, but the general theme was that Air Force space was being violated at random by a series of aircraft that should not have been there. At each of the bases, official logs record eyewitness accounts of the UFOs, and they are tracked by radar as well. In each case, the UFO reportedly hovers above the base, specifically the weapon storage area, for up to 40 minutes. All attempts to intercept or positively identify the UFO from the ground or with fighter jets in the air fail. The incursions are brought to the attention of the Commander-in-Chief of NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command. An investigation ensues. The initial um, thinking behind the, the unidentified objects over the Air Force bases in the northern tier was thought to be potentially Russians or else some other enemy. The only information we have is that the eyewitnesses described objects that behaved in a very unusual fashion, they, that they glowed red, for example, and it doesn't sound like any technology that the Soviets had at that time. A 
Another theory is that the UFO incursions were a type of readiness self-test to check the security of the bases in the event of an attack. But if it was a test, the bases performed poorly. The Air Force personnel were completely at sea as to what was happening. They were actually calling the law enforcement people in Great Falls, Montana for help because unidentified aircraft were buzzing them in missile control silos. They had no idea what was going on. Aside from acknowledging that unexplained events have occurred at the Northern Pier bases, the U.S. government remains characteristically silent on the question of whether American nuclear installments are indeed UFO hotspots. To my knowledge, there's no published report uh, explaining what happened. It's simply a mystery. And as far as the government is concerned, it can remain a mystery. According to the Air Force fact sheet on UFOs published in 1996, no evidence has been presented to indicate that further investigation of UFOs by the Air Force or other government agency is warranted. But for some, the base sightings are not quite as open and shut a case as the government would have us believe. We think the reason that the military tend to downplay this whole phenomenon is because the Department of Defense, by definition, needs to defend. And if theoretically there are objects that are able to violate United States airspace with impunity, that sets up a very big question mark about the efficiency and the abilities of the Department of Defense. But they are as bewildered and as puzzled and as intimidated as, as everybody else is. Coming up, amazing photographs and multiple sightings in Gulf Breeze, Florida divide the UFO community. Is it a hot spot or an elaborate hoax? It's November 11th, 1987 and Ed Walters, a building contractor in Gulf Breeze, Florida, is about to experience the UFO phenomenon firsthand. As he would later recount, Walters looks up from his desk and sees what he believes to be a UFO. He grabs his Polaroid camera and ventures outside. Walters manages to snap a photo of what appears to be a glowing, dome-shaped, bluish-gray craft hovering about 200 feet in the air. From 1987 to 1992, the small town of Gulf Breeze, Florida is famous for being an alleged UFO hotspot. Hundreds of eyewitnesses claim to see strange objects and unexplained lights in the sky. But Gulf Breeze is mired in controversy and allegations of a hoax. And Ed Walters stands at the center of the storm. On November 19, 1987, eight days after Ed Walters allegedly had his UFO encounter, the Gulf Breeze Sentinel publishes two of his five photographs. The next night, Walters claims to see another UFO and manages to take four more pictures, but decides not to publish them. Still, UFO fever has gripped Gulf Breeze, and by November 25th, reports of UFOs are pouring in. Hot spots are very intriguing. These are places where there are multiple sightings. Uh, one person sees something, a number of people see it shortly thereafter. The first person who notices it, the sense, uh, grants permission to the other people to make similar reports. Over the course of the next four months, Walters takes more than 20 photographs of a strange vessel on more than 10 different occasions. He even shoots one minute and 38 seconds of video of a UFO sighting on December 28, 1987. Walters, who chooses to remain anonymous at first, soon becomes the central figure in the Gulf Breeze sightings. But he isn't the only one who is seeing strange things in the night sky. Pensacola area, Gulf Breeze area, is not just Ed Walters. There were literally over 130 UFO incidents involving more than 200 witnesses in this area. 
And Ed Walters was only involved in 34 of those incidents. But it is Walters whose photographs and claims attract the attention of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, a nonprofit organization that studies UFO phenomena. In February 1988, MUFON provides Walters with a specially designed tamper-proof camera in order to authenticate his UFO experiences. It was a multi-lens camera that could uh, take more than one view at the same time. We bought new film, we put it in that camera, we had it certified as new, we had closed the camera, sealed it with wax. He was allowed to use the camera and he did get some pictures. It was again opened then under uh, security conditions. The films uh, were developed, found things on the film, and there's no way he could have faked that one. By the end of 1988, seven different MUFON investigators have analyzed the evidence in Gulf Breeze. Meteorological and site survey analyses conclude that the photographs were likely to have been taken on the days and at the times that Walters alleges they were. Walters himself passes a battery of examinations, including two polygraph tests. MUFON, satisfied that Walters' claims are real, officially authenticates the Gulf Breeze sightings. But in 1990, new doubts surface regarding the Ed Walters case. First, a model that resembles the UFO in Walter's photographs is found in the attic of his former residence in Gulf Breeze. Then, in July of that year, a teenager named Tommy Smith alleges that he witnessed Ed Walters faking the UFO photos. Buffon begins an investigation in a skeptical stance. Just like any private investigation or any police investigation, we go about it the same way. And like in any crime case, if more evidence comes along, we'll reopen a case. And we did reopen the case in Gulf Breeze because of Tommy Smith's allegation that Ed Walters had hoaxed it. MUFON sends two new investigators, Rex and Carol Salisbury, to Gulf Breeze. The Salisbury's findings indicate that Ed Walters doctored the photographs, particularly one called Photo 19 that shows the reflection of a UFO on the surface of a road. The Salisbury's believe that the photo was most likely made by using a small model and double exposure. But their conclusions are rejected by MUFON. They believe that the other sightings at Gulf Breeze were real. They stated that in their reports. They just didn't believe Ed Walters. Basically, MUFON fired them and sent somebody else in to authenticate, quote-unquote, the uh, sighting. The new investigator, named Gary Watson, questions the veracity of Tommy Smith's testimony. He also alleges that the model UFO found in the attic of Walter's former home was planted by someone who wanted to discredit Walter's. Watson concludes that Ed Walter's photos and story are true. Despite the controversy over the Walters sightings, reports of a new UFO begin to emerge in Gulf Breeze. Instead of looking like ships or vessels, the new sightings are characterized differently. There were various kinds of lights that were seen. Big red globes, uh, little white lights, some lights that maneuvered, some hovered, some shot away, some just disappeared. Oh, 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 you know it. From 1990 through 1992, residents of Gulf Breeze see the strange lights so often that they give them a nickname, Bubba. They organize sky watches, and by 1992, there are 170 recorded UFO sightings of Bubba. But then, in 1992, the lights disappear as mysteriously as they had appeared two years earlier. The lights have never been explained. And the Ed Walters case still divides the UFO community. Although strange lights are still occasionally seen in Gulf Breeze, it is no longer considered to be a UFO hotspot. Whatever supposedly was going on in Gulf Breeze, it's not going on anymore. Oh, look at that. Look at that.
at that. Thing. Oh, double. There it goes. It's oh. doubling. Up next, a Washington state man claims to be living in the middle of one of the world's major UFO hotspots. Winter 2002. Deep in the Mojave Desert, an alleged UFO hotspot, a flashing light beams a hopeful Morse-coded message to the stars. Hello, we are peaceful. Dr. Colm Kelleher and his colleagues at the National Institute of Discovery Science, or NIDS, are searching for signs of intelligent life in the universe. Armed with a light-gathering telescope, an electrospectrometer to analyze the light, and geomagnetic sensors to measure radio and microwave emissions, Dr. Kelleher hopes to amass physical data to prove, beyond a scientific doubt, that UFOs exist. The primary focus is to try to get physical data with respect to UFOs, and I think only a person who's been working in this field for quite a while would appreciate the absolute difficulty in getting physical data on UFOs because you never know when they're going to appear, you never know how long they're going to stay, and you never know why they would appear in a particular place. NIDS operates a 24-hour hotline for UFO sightings. And although 95% of the accounts turn out to be IFOs, identified flying objects, like airplanes or weather balloons, there is still the 5% that defies explanation. And that 5% is what interests Dr. Kelleher. If we got a series of reports, say in the last five or six months or even a year, from the same area, same location, different eyewitnesses that appeared to corroborate, we would take those reports seriously. And one alleged hotspot that is raising some serious questions in the UFO community is the Yakima Mount Adams area in southeastern Washington state. The Yakima Indian Reservation in Washington has the appearances of being a UFO hotspot for many years. UFOs have been reported from the fire towers, from rangers, from uh, people camping, that sort of thing, over and over and over. James Gilliland is the owner of the Sattva Sanctuary, a UFO-friendly spiritual retreat located nearby. He claims the whole area is rife with UFO activity. The sanctuary here is located right at the base of Mount Adams next to the Yakima Reservation and it has over a hundred year history of recorded UFO activity. Well, I'd say this is probably one of the major hotspots in the world right now because it's almost nightly that we see at least one or two if not 15 to 25 UFOs flying in the area. Gilliland and fellow seekers gather regularly in the summer months for sky watches. They play music and meditate and wait patiently for UFOs to appear. They're looking for people that are very spiritually aware, that have kind hearts, that, that love people, love humanity and the earth. And those are the ones that will be ambassadors to bring forward their message because those people have risen to the occasion. As Gilliland and others see it, the anomalous lights that appear above his property exhibit both intelligence and intent. What these ships are doing, they're inquisitive, they're morphing, they're responding to lights, they're responding to the telepathic messages of those people on the ground. Whoa! Oh, there we go. We got it. That was a good one. We actually have some that morph from a round object to a triangle when we draw a big triangle in the sky. And then it goes back to a round object and then leaves again with multiple witnesses. When you're talking about lights in the sky, it's very difficult to say what causes them. Are they natural phenomena or are they not? When they seem to fly into an area, uh, stop and react to people yelling or to flashes of light or something else, what causes a reaction? Do natural phenomena do that? 
One theory proposes that the lights in the sky are not doing anything, but the observer's eyes are. Something called the autokinetic phenomenon, the, the eye literally cannot focus properly on a single bright point source of light against a dark background, and so it seems to bob around, move around, wiggle, zigzag. All these things are perfectly normal behavior, but it's the behavior of your eye, it's not the behavior of the object itself. Trick of the eye or not, some believe that Gilliland's role at the center of the UFO activity that surrounds his home is characteristic of all of the areas deemed a hot spot. We've investigated in a couple of uh, quote-unquote hot spots and we are beginning to realize that any of the areas that we focus on usually has a single individual in that area who becomes a lightning rod for multiple reports from the community. When you have a charismatic leader or somebody who's identified as an authority on UFOs, people will go where that leader says the UFOs are to be found and there'll be more people watching and you'll have more sightings reported in those areas. But it's a psychological, sociological kind of a thing. It's not related in any way to what's actually up there. The major portion of people that are coming here are more aligned to trying to understand the experience on a more spiritual nature, but we do have a lot of, we call them looky-loos, that are coming just to try to see one. That there are strange, often inexplicable phenomena in the night sky is undeniable. But just what these phenomena are, and whether they tend to cluster in time and place to form UFO hotspots is open to debate. As far as the skeptics are concerned, on every level, you cannot instill want into another being. You can't get them to open their eyes or look at what's obvious. We showed them footage of ships flying behind trees, landing on the mountain doing phenomenal feats, making U-turns, um, right-angle turns at several thousand miles an hour. And their standard pat answer is these are meteors or satellites. It's just amazing. We don't want to feel that we're alone in the universe. We don't want to feel that life is without a purpose. We don't want to feel that there's nothing out there in the way of a mystery. We human beings want our lives to be exciting. But just because something is exciting doesn't make it true. ever colonize it like we do in the movies? What are the dangers that lie in wait for us? Join us for an entire weekend as we separate science fiction from science fact. Final Frontier Weekend, tonight at 8 p.m. as only the History Channel can bring you.